Welcome to the hours. I'm Tyler. This is Mark. We are Savvy Coaching. Mark's got a Utah Jazz shirt on. I don't know if it's actually uh, he's had it for 20 years or it was made to look that way. Made to look this way. And I would say uh, it is a Utah Jazz shirt, but in my mind, it's a New Orleans Jazz shirt. Mm. Why do you think they have never, this is not the big question, this is a small question. Why have the Utah Jazz never changed their name? It seems that I mean, there's very little jazz in Utah. Yep, uh, it's a sticking point down here in South Louisiana. We'd love to have the New Orleans Jazz back instead of the Pelicans. Um, that why needs have, to happen. Yeah, at, and I mean, they wouldn't mess with an iconic brand like the Lakers too, but technically they should right. change as well, right? The Supersonics changed. Yeah, We have the, uh, the OKC Thunder. Yeah, okay. I'm on team Bring the Jazz Back to New Orleans. And uh, you know, let Utah brand their own uh, their own. Gosh, what would Utah be? That's tough. Oh gosh, the, the Utah with... the Utah Normals, like the Utah <laughs> <laughs> something with uh, they got to play off the mountains. You know, they got the mile high thing going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. Okay. Um, well, that's probably not why everybody's here. Um, welcome. So the goal of the hours is to spend time with all the coaches in our community and to serve you better and to talk basketball with you, answer your questions a little more in depth. Um, and yeah, hopefully to, uh, to help coach you. We're on a mission to coach coaches. Uh, so to coach you and give you a little bit more depth and insight to the answers we're giving you in the community. So uh, Mark and I kind of popcorn back and forth on a big question. Maybe it's relevant with what's going on in the game. Maybe it's just something that we ran into uh, this week. And so here is the big question. I think this is a common, this is a common issue for coaches. And I think that maybe uh, there might, you might get a hot take here. Mark, would you choose to play, start, play more, whatever, uh, a big who's the seventh most skilled player on your team or a player of average height and athleticism who's the fifth most skilled player on your team. Let's just simplify it and say who's starting and assuming that starting means they're getting more minutes. Okay. I've actually been in this situation before. So this yeah. one's uh, still a big question, but maybe easier for me. Um, we were four out, one in for years. And I found myself in not even this predicament because I didn't even think about being able to go five out just because the system we were running was really built on four out. But I felt like we were playing our four best players and then the next, the, the, our best post player. And sometimes that was our seventh, eighth, ninth man. Um, so it's exactly the situation you went to. We adjusted our system to be five out. And I found it so freeing as a coach for a couple reasons. One, we could play our five best players or most skilled players or whoever deserves a start. Uh, we could take positions out and play more role-based. And another added benefit was practice, was so much more flexible, uh, where if we were playing three on three, we never had to uh, stop and ask, well, are we playing you know two perimeters and a post player? Or it's just, hey, we're all basketball players, whether we're short, medium, tall. Uh, let's just, you know, we can, we can run our entire offense two on two or five on five, it didn't matter. So easy one for me, I'm going with the most skilled. Okay, would you say, follow up question before I answer um, myself, would you say that the majority of high school coaches would answer that the same as you or different than you? Different. I, I, I agree. And that's why I wanted to make this the big question. And so, you know, in a roundabout way, I think what, cause I would answer uh, the same as Mark. Um, I would probably even trend further. If equal, I'm playing the smaller player um, myself. If equal, I'm playing the smaller player myself because I believe that gives us more matchup problems. Um, so if, if, if everyone else in, I'll say it for myself, if everyone else that we're playing in our league is doing A, I will do my absolute best to do B if all else is equal. Um, it, it, they, I, would, I want to be the aggressor, not the reactor. I want to make them adjust. We don't want to adjust. And if an opponent that's playing a big sees us not playing a traditional big or a traditional way, I don't have anything against tall players. I have, I have a lot against bad players. 
Um, if, if they see, if they see us not playing a traditional big, so maybe we got a six seven player, but they're not playing on the block or inside the arc or whatnot, they have to adjust what they're doing. They have to make a decision. Um, we're not going to change what we're doing. So that's that's why I would trend that direction um, even more. And I ran into it, and you know, there's there's some things fresh in my mind, and I really hope that. Um, there'll be a lot of t things that Mark and I reference here on the hours that come out of our conversations with you. I say you because the ones, those of you that are listening to this are probably the ones that we are interacting with in our community, coaching in our grow group consulting, coaching one-on-one -on -one in our court side, or doing clinics with. And so there's many things that come up in brief conversations that we don't have. I, I don't have, I'll speak for myself. I, I don't think that it's a priority to dive deep and, and provide feedback to you on things that I hear you say or questions that you ask because there's not enough time for context. That's why we call this the hours. We have hours to go ahead and provide context and hopefully challenge some ideas, respectfully challenge some ideas. Um, and so I'm coming out of many conversations and observations where coaches are naming these players in their top five that I'm flabbergasted because they have little to no impact on the game. They're just big. Um, and so I, I think that I would just challenge, strongly challenge defaulting to playing a player because they're big and wanted to share that off the jump. Yeah. You asked if most coaches would answer the way we answered and I said no, and you agreed. And it's completely true because all of my conversations or a lot of my conversations with coaches steer around this. Right. Should we be four out or five out? Um, what should our alignment be, uh, whether or our shape be? Uh, and the concern is always, well, what are we going to do on defense if we don't have a post player? Right. So I, I love your thinking of one, if everybody's doing A, let's do B and make the other team adjust to us because we may think it's a matchup problem. Like who's going to guard their post player? But we need to reshape or reframe our thinking to be who's going to, who, who of their defenders are going to guard our five skilled players that can all shoot it, drive it and move it. So uh, we've always asked the question, can we do what everybody else does in the league and win it? If the answer is no, then let's be the outlier. Let's be the one team that everybody has to adjust for. And I think there's a certain level of confidence in your system when you're convicted in what you're doing that is, bleeds into your players and you go into games, you go into seasons, just um, thinking that you are the best team on your schedule. Uh, I know for me, we always um, heard, or we always tried to design our system to beat the best team on our schedule. And then I started reframing it to let's design our system to be the best team on our schedule. And we wanted to be the boogeyman instead of worrying about how we're going to beat the boogeyman. So yeah. completely changed our program and the mindsets of our players. And then uh, we kind of hit that flywheel where we had some exponential results. And not only our system became more freeing, but our players' confidence level just went through the roof. Yeah. Okay, that's really good. Um, let, let's go one step deeper on this because I think that this is related and hopefully valuable as well. And then we'll, uh, then we'll shift into our next segment. Again, these come out of conversations that we have with coaches. The coach that I had this conversation with is probably going to listen to this. And so I hope you do. Um, and, and so I'm not sharing your name because I do have coaching or feedback, but I've heard this from a lot of coaches. And so I do want to address this as well. I recently asked a coach, Mark, um, what do you do offensively? Because they asked some questions about what I would suggest, they how they approach um, different scenarios. And so I wanted to zoom out to see if we could fit it into their overall offensive philosophy. And so I asked this coach, what do you do offensively? And this coach answered, oh, we run four out. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of time to really dive into it. And so I just kind of, uh, I brushed over that and answered his question uh, because his answer told me some things about, um, about their philosophy in that they didn't really have one. Because I want to share this, your alignment is not your philosophy. Four out is not an offense. Um, four out is an alignment. It's a way that you achieve spacing, but it's not, it's not your offense. And I think that um, maybe coaches make some assumptions that if they run four out, then they do something, maybe more, more dribble drive. I don't know, but I just wanted to push back and, and I want to spend a few minutes, Mark, um, asking you your opinion 
on, okay, let me just throw it this way. Um, how would you have handled that situation? Um, you're trying to give a coach advice. You ask what they do on offense. They say we're four out. What would you, wh where do you go next? What would you want to communicate to, to coaches that um, answer that question that way? Hmm. I would, I guess my follow-up question to them would be, okay, well, how do you put pressure on the rim or how do you create advantages? And that might get me a better look at what their offense is. I asked a bad is. question. That's a much better question. That's a much better question. Um, okay. So then they say, um, then they say, we tend to do that with dribble drive, but I would like more off ball screening. Common question I get or, or answer. Yes. I get. Yes. So how, what would be my next question there? Or how would I approach that conversation if they said that? Um, yeah, let, let's answer that question. Let's answer that question because, because it, it's common. So I've run into that a lot. That's why I wanted to bring it up. You run okay. into that a lot. So I, th I think, I think the first point that, that I just want to hammer home and make to coaches is your, your shape or your alignment. Are we using shape and alignment synonymously, Mark? Um, I would say no per our last conversation. Alignment okay. four out, five out. Shape, you know, we've played with different kind of non-traditional five out shapes, right? I think the traditional five out shape is your top wings, corners. So let's uh, let's not. Okay, so alignment would be five out, four out, one in, three out, two in. Okay, mm. that's that's going to be a lot. That's going to be um, that's going to be alignment. Shape is going to be where those spots are on the floor. So if you play with a two guard front, that would be a shape. If you play with like a one guard front, that would be a shape. If you play with a no guard front, that'd be a shape. Um, if you're overloading one side of the floor, that would be a shape. Um, so alignment is um, more how many players you have inside or outside the arc and your shape is those spots that you want them to occupy. Yep, sounds good. Beautiful. Shape shape slash positioning could be used maybe synonymously. Cool, so your, 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 um, your alignment is not your offense. Um, your, your offense is the principles by which you score. The goal of offense is to score. Um, and we know that, okay, principle number one is we want to hunt nines or put pressure on the rim. When we put pressure on the rim. We create advantages. We create advantage catches, um, usually outside the three point line. Um, and so, okay, how do you do that? How do you put pressure on the rim first to then create closeouts and advantage catches and get into dominoes? That's your offense. Um, and so that's the, the next best question. So when we get to that Coaches tend to say, well, we put pressure on the rim. We're, we're a dribble drive team, um, but we'd like to incorporate more off ball screening. So let's uh, have you answer that question, Mark, and then we'll move on from there. Yeah, I think there's two. Let's, let's take the dribble drive team. They're the extreme end of the spectrum. They're going to drive, kick, share space to create nines and sevens. On the other end of that spectrum would be your team that is very traditional, maybe a lot of set plays or uh, a five or like a motion team, right? That's going to do a lot of cutting, a lot of screening to get the ball into the paint. What we try to help coaches do, what we help coaches do is find the blend that fits their philosophy and their personnel. So I actually had a, a courtside call uh, with a coach in Ohio and we had this exact conversation yesterday. I told him there's, there's this side of the spectrum, there's this, where, what blend works well for you. So how would we do that? Um, with triggers to me. And I love to use triggers as, uh, for ball location. So for us ball in the action spot equals rose series, that is going to be more of our drive and kick game where we're creating space and advantages for our players to make plays for themselves or their teammates. Uh, we could also use those actions to cue a trigger that would maybe flip into another family of actions that may look like a more traditional offense. Princeton, ball screen. Um, I love to incorporate split action into a conceptual offense because I love the pace uh, that you can run it with. So um, I would say um, you want kind of flow of offense, spacing before advantage, advantage before shot. How do we create those advantages? You can have multiple series or multiple ways that you create advantages. First would be your drive and kick game. Second would be what I would just simply call a screening game. And then let's find triggers where we can organically flow between our drive and kick game and our screening game organically without calls. 
Okay, so coaches want that. Okay, they like that. Here, here's the question that coaches are asking. I've been telling my players to screen for two years. I just can't get them to screen. That's the problem, right? So, so I, I think you're going to come back to triggers. But like, what if we, what if we even just like gave very simple? All right, all right here it is, Mark. Um, I can't get my, I can't get my players to screen. I've been telling them to screen for two years. I've, I've, I've screamed at them. I've punished them. I've ran them into the ground. They still won't set an off-ball screen. Um, I'm going to bring you in for 30 minutes. And do you think you can get my players to set off ball screens in 30 minutes? I think I could. How would you do it? You have 30 minutes. First, if running made a screen better, I'd probably just go recruit the cross country team and they would, <laughs> they would be excellent screeners, right? Um, outside of the cross country team, I would first ask that coach, well, what, what are you telling your player? How are, how are your players finding the screen? So a lot of I want to say, I want to try to avoid rules. Like what are the rules for your screens? But most coaches that I talk to, they'll say, well, we just tell them to do it like when they feel like it, right? And they don't have clear instruction or a clear cue teaching point um, in order to screen. The way we've had uh, success doing it would be give players an A, B option. A cut, B screen. I don't care which one you choose choose one. We can take that a step further and say, uh, make it role based. When you make this pass. Uh, uh, so here's a clear trigger. When we pass through a single gap, let's screen. So if I pass through a single gap, that is telling me I'm now going to go screen and whatever that screen looks like, let's say it's it's an away screen or, or getting in the split action. That's the way I would do it is just give them an AB option. Typically, when we're left with AB, becomes very, very simple. We always told our players, it does not matter which one that you choose, just be decisive in your choice and we can all play off of it. Yep. Um, really good. And I, I will, uh, I will, I will actually go a step simpler. So at Savvy, we believe simplicity wins. What Mark just said will work for some teams. And I would actually say for some teams, it actually needs to be even simpler than that. Um, so Mark said, give them an A, B option. If you, and I would try that. And if you give them an A, B option and they still don't screen, then give them a option mm -hmm. and, and, and don't even give them a choice. It's like, when this happens, do this. And then I would go even simpler. And this is kind of where we started with race and space with what we call 11 second action is it's fully scripted, right? If no nine or seven in the first seven seconds of the possession, we will do this action. There's no A, B option, right? We will run split. Um, and so like I, I, if we're zooming all the way back to the question, my players don't screen, how do I get them to screen? Establish it as a standard. It's like, this is the only acceptable thing in this situation as an A. Once you get an A option, then I think you can grow into your A, B options. Um, now, if you have a team like Mark, where Mark has had in the past, where he has taught conceptual op offense for years. Um, they've developed a comfort level with the messiness, all of that stuff. I think then you can go to ABs, but for so many coaches that are, that are coming over to a conceptual op offense for the first time, um, I found like step one is just script it and then they can start to go off book. Um, so that would be like, if that doesn't work, that'd be the next level or if you have a very young team. Yeah, and I'm glad you said, let's take it a step simpler. Um, here's, here's where I've always tried to, the kind of method that I've tried to coach with is like you're saying a B option would be best case scenario, right? That's the end game. Sometimes I try to start there, see what we're comfortable with. And then we can always work backwards and say, you know what, we're not screening. So let's remove the cutting. And if we remove the cutting, the only thing left is to screen. We had um, a coach reach out and said his players are struggling to um, to cut, right? To find the right cut or to, um, to vary their cuts. And my answer would be the exact same. Okay, we'll remove everything else, right? Just like you said. And it could be when we are neutral or when we get to 11 second offense, this is the only action that we have. Now, is that going to just work right away? Maybe for some. 
for others, they might pass, have to process, okay, now what do I do? Or maybe they cut by habit, right? That's okay. I think what a master coach can do is stay calm, understand that learning is a process and learning is permanently change behavior. Even if maybe we do it on air, maybe we do it once or twice, they're really just performing it, right? It's like a, a rehearsal for a play. Uh, we might not learn our lines permanently, right? Where it's like, we're just going to rehearse it uh, and we're performing. It doesn't mean that it's permanently changed behavior. So when you're in that process, if the player, let's say, passes and cuts instead of screens, just stop, recreate. Um, Tyler, if you pass, what are we looking to do? Ah, oh, screen. My bad, coach. Okay, let's do it now. Pass and let's go screen, right? Mm -hmm. So we get really quick feedback. Uh, really quick application. And then that's the process that you have to go through. But it's like anything, um, it's going to take time. I think some coaches will get frustrated or move away from it because they don't see the immediate results. And I wouldn't expect to see immediate results. Yeah, that's that's key. And um, we got a follow up question actually live in the chat box here. Um, I think I will give the answer that will frustrate coaches. And then we'll let you give an answer that coaches will actually appreciate and like. Um, <laughs> So, so let, I'll go first on this one. Uh, so Jeremy asked, okay, so we're talking about actions here. He's like, so what are some actions you would incorporate when the ball reaches the corner? And he throws out the idea of busts. Okay, here's the answer that will frustrate court, uh, coaches. I wouldn't run any actions from the corner. Um, the ball, first off, should never go to the corner unless there's an advantage, in, in, in my philosophy. Only pass the corner if there's a big advantage um and which might result in some small advantages okay inevitably sometimes the ball is going to get to the corner with no advantage where we're neutral just get it out of there as fast as you can and get it to another trigger point i just think it's one of the worst places to run actions and why would we spend time on something that's going to happen least um let's spend more time on actions that are going to happen most because the ball shouldn't go there very much yeah okay so pressure's on me to give give a different answer here right so, <laughs> or you can say the same one i just assume that you would actually have some actions from the corner you might have i just I um Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, let's say we we drive in the space. Help comes from corner. Corner. We get uh, you know maybe a skirmish or stunt. We kick to corner and we don't produce uh, a seven. We don't attack closeout. So if we don't shoot it, we don't drive it. We got to move it, right? So I wouldn't want to run action for the corner. I wouldn't want to ball screen the corner. Um, but a bust, what Jeremy, my guy, is referring to is like an uphill dribble handoff out of the corner. So it's a way to move the ball out, um, which is good action. Could could be good action, right? Uh, it's kind of like yeah. that pseudo ball screen, DHO. And I love an uphill dribble handoff. It's like one of my like favorite actions in basketball because you get your your handoff going downhill instead of uphill like you would on, on a traditional DHO. Is but, a bust the same as a grenade? Yes, Basically, okay. yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I just like bust because, like, the the terminology of like, hey, we're busting out of the corner, we're busting out of the post here. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, grenade out of the corner is a way to move it out. But what I've also uh, let, let's go back to the rose example. So rose series ball in action spots, ball in corner could trigger another series or action. One thing that I've liked is lifting the porch or dunker when the ball goes to the corner. So now as the ball goes up to the action spot and over, you could change series. That could be a trigger for screening game. Um, and I love a step up screen. I know you like this action as well. Ball crosses the top, action to action. Now we're in a flat screen from the, the dunker. See that a lot in the NBA. I love that action. That could be triggered off a pass to the corner. So now when we go up over, um, I also love zooms there or flash game, get game, whatever your terminology is, is a way to incorporate split action, right? We lift ball goes to corner. It goes up over. We lift our porch, we feed, and now we can go screen away and get split action, which I would love. So honestly, I think you can do a lot of things with, with ball in the corner and lifting your porch or dunker. I would say uh, to answer Jeremy question, he said, what are some actions? I think you can incorporate anything. I would pick your your favorite. Um, and then that's what we do, right? And courtside is just, what are your favorite actions that you want to incorporate? Let's find some triggers to where we can make this thing flow like water. 
flow like water. Okay, um, we got to move off that. Uh, we got to move on. This is good. Greg's giving some great reminders in the chat as well. Really appreciate it, Greg. Uh, very wise. Um, really appreciate you being a part of the community. Keep those reminders coming. All right, let's go into the mailbag. Um, Mark, in transition. This is good. Mark and I are going to disagree on some stuff here. This is great. I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm just going to, I'm just going to be really conflicting here. It's going to be great. Um, I'm going to lean in. I'm going to lean into conflict. Uh, transition pitch aheads versus hunting with the dribble through the speed zone. Mark, I don't know. Um, should, should I do a screen share so people know about this? So we actually visually see this or should we just talk about it? What do you think about defining um, some terms first? I think we can talk about it. Okay. Um, all right, so we're defining the speed zone as that's that space on the floor from the top of the key to the top of the key, that space between the arcs. Speed zone is typically where we want to clear it as fast as possible because very little good things happen for the offense. Really only good things happen for the defense. There's a chance for them to, um, the longer it takes us, they get to set up their defense. They can, they can pressure, they can trap, they can do a lot of things, and we can't put a lot of pressure on the rim. There's not a lot of scoring passes or scoring shots taken in the speed zone. So we just want to get through it as quickly as possible. We agree on that. Now, where we're going to disagree is on how. Um, how we primarily want to get the ball through the speed zone. Um, Mark, why should we pitch the ball ahead through the speed zone? Because I would argue it's the fastest way to get the ball out of the, the speed zone is the ball is going to move faster than any player can. So one, let's pitch ahead. Principal play for us was pass to the first open player because when we move the ball, we move the defense. Also in transition, the reason why we are racing is to create advantage so we can arrive in dominoes. By pitching ahead, I would argue that's the easiest way to get defenders behind the ball. Tell me why, <laughs> tell me why. You, well, let me say this before, before you can show the conflicting thought, this is what's really been a lot of fun in working together because I would say our strategy is the same. We want to get through the speed game, the speed zone as fast as possible. We want to play in, in transition, create advantages, but our tactics differ. But I think you can structure and, and your tactics should change year to year based on your personnel but your strategy or philosophy doesn't have to change. So I want to play fast, but no matter what, well, maybe, we, well, I'll let you go, but I was going to say maybe we have a dominant point guard and maybe that would even change my tactic of how I'd play in the speed zone. But go ahead, tell me, uh, tell I me. I feel your like point. I should just let you keep talking and then you can make my argument for it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right. I don't disagree with anything you said. Like I like strategically completely agree. And even tactically, I agree. Um, so let me ask a couple of questions, um, because if a coach embraced the strategy of racing first, racing always so that we can arrive with a domino with an advantage, you, that is the number one goal. Like if you embrace that strategy, you're going to find some tactics to help you get there if you fully commit to the strategy. Um, and in all of the one on one consulting that we do and all the group consulting that we do and all of the in person teaching that we do. I have not yet seen a coach as fully committed to racing as they could be. I, I've, I've not once. So the, I mean, here's where Mark and I are on a mission and uh, we're on a mission to get all of you, all coaches to commit more fully and spend more time and hold higher standards and teach more tactics around racing first, racing always, um, playing in transition and playing with the advantage that that creates. It is the easiest and I would argue best way to create big advantage shots and big advantage decisions. So do that. Now, what we're getting into uh, as far as arguing is the tactics. And um, I, I think that's probably only an argument for, um, for savants because most people need to be convinced to do the first thing more. And here's the blind spot, um, I will say, most coaches think they do play well in transition. Most coaches think they do um, encourage and teach their teams and hold a high standard for um, playing in transition more. But then I just ask this question, what percentage of your shot attempts come in the first seven seconds of the shot clock? And if it's less than 50%, then you are not yet at the standard that I think is gonna be most efficient. Mark, I think you shared that you guys got up above, well above 50% as far as like shots taken um, out of advantages created in transition. 
Usually, yeah. I mean, we, yeah. Right. Okay. So all that being said, I would not primarily teach the tactic of passing through the speed zone. Instead, I would urge getting the ball to your racker in the speed zone and let them rack. Now, there's, there's three things that are really important uh, to differentiate here. One, getting the ball to them in the speed zone, not in what Mark has called the dead zone. The dead zone is the deep or the, the end of the floor that we're defending, top of key to the baseline. We do not want to catch outlets there. If we catch outlets there, we're giving away one of our uh, one of our greatest advantages to racing the basketball. So we want to teach every player to be their own outlet, clear the dead zone with the dribble, and pass to our racker as far through the speed zone as possible. I would love it if our rackers caught the ball at or beyond half court, which is very similar to the pitch ahead pass that Mark's talking about. Um, but instead of our racker, or traditionally what uh, coaches would call a point guard, instead of the point guard pitching ahead, I want to pitch ahead to our racker. Second thing, that you have a racker. <laughs> this only works if you have a racker. And a racker is different than a point guard. A point guard in a traditional understanding is someone that can set up your half court offense, that can run your actions without losing the basketball. And um, typically they tend to be a smaller player that may not be a gifted scorer, but they are a great leader, they're vocal, they're smart, and they can dribble the ball without turning it over. Um, in, in the race and space offense, there's really not much of a role for a traditional point guard. Instead, we want to identify a racker, which thankfully that's the way the game is trending is it's elevating those skill sets. Can you get to the rack at an above average rate and you finish at the rack at an above average rate? Think Luka Doncic, uh, think James Harden, think Giannis. That's a racker. That's not your traditional uh, point guard. That's not Mark Price. That's not John Stockton. Okay. So if, we, if you have that player who is significantly better at getting to and finishing at the rack than everyone else, then I would argue that you're going to be more efficient with them hunting the advantage as opposed to pitching ahead to any random person hunting the advantage. If you don't have that player, then I think my argument becomes much weaker. Um, there, there, if you have all players that are equally good at that, then I think my argument becomes much weaker. I, I've shared this with Mark uh, this week. On both ends of the competitive spectrum, on the lower end of the competitive spectrum and on the highest end of the competitive spectrum, you tend to have teams that have rackers that are significantly um, better than their teammates at getting to the rack. And so then I would say you need to play this way. Um, and if you are more in the middle of the competitive spectrum, when you have a lot more parity on your team, then I think you have a lot more freedom to do what Mark is suggesting. Those, that's my second point. It was a long one. I apologize. Um, here's the third one. Many thoughts make for slow feet. I love absolute simplicity and absolute role clarity. And so when anyone can um, dribble the ball and anyone can pitch ahead, I find that there's a moment uh, in time in nearly every possession where people are trying to make a decision. They're trying, okay, who is it that we're passing the ball to? Um, are we overloaded on, on one side of the floor? How far should I run? Should I stop and actually be ready for the pitch ahead? I find that that level of indecision overall, I would argue, slows us down. Whereas I just want players to get to the corners as quick as possible. And I believe that the quickest way to flatten out the defense and fill the corners is to say, Mark, you're filling the left corner every time. Don't even think about looking back for a pitch ahead. We're not going to pitch it to you. And so then they just run. Yeah. I think... Uh... We are on, again, philosophically all the same, but we tend to operate on two separate ends, right? Like you're very much absolute base to start and maybe to a fault. I'm the other yeah. way. Like, hey. I thought you were saying mine's to a fault and I was agreeing with that. Okay. Well, yeah, we could. Hey, it could be. Yeah. <laughs> mine is, uh, hey, let's try this thing and we can always add constraints to move it closer to absolutes. But as you're talking, um, if I could go and install this today with a team and let's say we were preparing for our next season, I might start there and just build the habit of racing because you're right. If I'm looking back for a, a pitch ahead, I'm probably not racing. Right. So we would tell yeah. our players, 
you're not looking back before half court. You are getting to a dead sprint by half court. You're beating your defender. You're racing your defender, right? First three steps is a sprint, all those things. But you might want to start with just racing and then see, hey, race to half. Now we're looking to pitch ahead if we're kind of in that middle zone, which I've been blessed to, to be at, which is why it's been so successful for me at the high school level. We had we were thankful and blessed enough to have a lot of different players that can make plays. And then at the mid major college level, that's kind of what you have too. Uh yep. a lot of yep. players that are very, very similar. Uh so it worked for us. Uh but again, great example of uh of adjusting system to personnel. And I know we're running short on time here. Let me piggyback something in the game of the week. You cool with that? Yep. Now, so you mentioned be your own outlet, which we are, uh, we taught the same thing. Love it. We had a coach in the community ask, um, I'm having trouble training our players to be their own outlet or, or to develop them as a player that can be their own outlet. Um, we shared three ball transition, which allows different people to push the ball last week is our game of the week for this week. I'll just add a constraint. If you're playing, five on five, or if your players are coming in the gym for summer playing pickup, make the rule or the constraint that whoever gets the rebound has to dribble the ball across half court. Does that violate some of our racker roles or our pitch ahead rules? Absolutely. But we're training something else. So uh, can we strip away everything else? And today we're focused on developing everybody to be their own outlet. So I would play make or miss we grab the ball out of the net whoever gets it has to cross half court with the dribble will it be messy absolutely will your players get better absolutely that's good um really good and if they want to reference that game of the week or drill of the week is that posted is that is that for our grow members only or is that posted in the free community what do you you, yeah it's in the hour so it's 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 in the hours last week yeah, last yep. week's hours, and we can we can throw it in the drill book, which would be available. Uh, it would be chopped up for our grow community, but everybody has access to the hours. Yeah. So if you are in the grow community, you can get that in the drill book. If you're not yet, um, sorry, if you're in our grow membership, it would be in the drill book. If you're not yet a grow member, I would really encourage you to try it out for a month. Um, you get access to our entire drill book. You get access to all of our courses, uh, race space, lock left, rose series, everything, as well as you get, uh, you get direct coaching and consulting from Mark and myself, either through our group, uh, consulting or through uh, video feedback as well. So please check that out. Uh, we'd love to work with you. Okay. Let's bring it home with one practiced better reminder. Uh, I'll go ahead and take this one, and uh, then you can sign us off here. One teaching tool that I think will help your team practice better is to go a step further on your correction. So most coaches identify something that um, a player did wrong, and many coaches will actually rewind and put players back into the positions where the poor decision was made or the opportunity existed and teach it. And then they move on. Whereas I have found a lot of success in giving do-overs. So you do the everything that you normally do, correct, put them back in the positions and whatnot, and say, okay, now let's do it over correctly. So from that moment, we say, okay, let's make the correct choice. And so then you can just say oh, in the future, you don't even have to correct because most time players actually know what they made a mistake. And you say do-over and they reset to the same formation and they just play play the rep out and you might have to actually reset it for them two three four times but if you can start to embrace do-overs then i had players even i was working with the team for two days the last two days by the second day when i would blow a whistle before i could even coach jamal for example he was he was their rack or smart guy jamal would be like give me a do-over coach i'm like sure sure and so he set it up he's like get back get back here let's do over because he knew it gave him a chance to win the game right so if you can start with do-overs then it becomes player-led oh my gosh then you have, you've got teams that are really learned in there so embrace do-overs but if you never give them a chance to do it over if you just point out their mistakes they're not going to actually be able to correct it yeah telling someone to do something doesn't change behavior right got to do it love it um well, thanks everybody for spending this time with us together on the hours. Um, 
we would love for you to hop in to our new community. I'm going to drop the link in the description uh, of the pod. So if you're listening live, go back and check it. If you're listening recorded, it'll be down below for you to check out. Um, anytime you get a Mark Price shout out. <laughs> so thanks for being here, y'all. This is The Hours. I'm Mark. He's Tyler. We're Savvy Coaching. Uh, as always, stay savvy, everybody. Bring the jazz back to New Orleans. That's right.